This is Part 10, Volume 1, of the New and Complete Newgate Calendar, read by Roy Schreiber. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Particulars respecting John Stanley, who was hanged for murder. Mr. Stanley was the son of an officer in the army, and was born in the year 1690 at Deuce Hall in Essex, a seat that belonged to Mr. Palmer, who was his uncle by the mother's side. Young Stanley being the favourite of his father, the latter began to teach him the art of fencing when he was no more than five years of age, and other officers likewise practising the same art with him. He became a kind of master of the sword when he was but a mere boy for to stimulate his courage it was common for those who fenced with him to give him wine or other strong liquors in consequence of this treatment the boy grew daring and insolent beyond expression and at length behaved with so uncommon a degree of audacity that his father deemed him a singular character of bravery while he was very young mr stanley being ordered to join his regiment in spain took his son with him and in that country he was the spectator of several engagements. But his principal delight was in trampling on the bodies of the deceased after the battles were ended. From Spain the elder Stanley was ordered to Ireland, whither he took his son, and there procured for him an ensign's commission. But the young gentleman, habituating himself to extravagant company, spent much more money than the produce of his commission, which he soon sold, and then returned to England. The father was greatly mortified at this proceeding, and advised him to make application to General Stanhope, who had been a warm friend of the family. But this advice was lost on the young fellow, who abandoned himself to the most dissolute course of life, borrowed money of all his acquaintance, which he soon squandered at the gaming tables, and procured further supplies from women with whom he made illicit connections. He was so vain of his acquaintance with the ladies that he boasted of their favours as an argument in proof of his own accomplishments. Though what he might obtain from the weakness of one woman, he commonly squandered on others of more abandoned character. One mode which he took to supply his extravagance was to introduce himself into the company of young gentlemen who were but little acquainted with the vices of the age, whom he assisted in wasting their fortunes in every species of scandalous dissipation. At length, after a scene of a riot in London, he went with one of his associates to Flanders, and thence to Paris, and Stanley boasted not a little of his favours he received among the french ladies and of the improvements he made in the science of fencing on his return to england the opinion he conceived of his skill in the use of the sword made him insufferably vain and presuming he would frequently intrude himself into company at a tavern and saying he was come to make himself welcome would sit down at the table without farther ceremony the company would sometimes bear with his insolence for the sake of peace. But when this was the case, it was a chance if he did not pretend to have received some affront, and drawing his sword, walk off while the company was in confusion. It was not always, however, that matters thus ended, for sometimes a gentleman of spirit would take the liberty of kicking our hero out of the house. It will now be proper to mention something of his connection with Mrs. Maycock, the murder of whom cost him his life. As he was returning from a gaming-house which he frequented in Covent Garden, he met a Mr. Bryant of Newgate Street and his sister, Mrs. Maycock, the wife of a mercer of Ludgate Hill. Stanley rudely ran against the man, and embraced the woman, on which a quarrel arose, but this subsiding Stanley insisted on seeing the parties home. This he did, and spent the evening with them. And from this circumstance a fatal connection arose, as will appear in the sequel. Stanley, having made an acquaintance with the family, soon afterwards met Mrs. Maycock at the house of a relation in Red Lion Street, Holborn. In a short time, Mr. Maycock, removing into Southwark, the visits of our captain were admitted on a footing of intimacy. 
The husband dying soon after this connection, Stanley became more at liberty to pay his addresses to the widow, and it appears that some considerable intimacy subsisted between them from the following letter, which is not more a proof of the absurd vanity of the man that could write it than of the woman that could keep him company after receiving it. The egregious coxcomb and supercilious flatterer is visible in every line. Quote, I am to-morrow to be at the opera. Oh, that I could add, with her I love. The opera, where beauties less beauteous than thou, sit panting, admired, and taste the sweet barbarian sounds. On Friday I shall be at the masquerade at Somerset House, where modest pleasure hides itself before it will be touched. But though it is uncertain in the shape, tis real in the sense. For masks scorn to steal and not repay. Therefore, as they conceal the face, they oft make the body the better known. At this end of town, many faded beauties bid the oleos and the brush kiss their cheeks and lips till their charms only glimmer with a borrowed grace, so that a city beauty, rich in her native spring of simplicity and loveliness, will doubly shine with us, shine like the innocent morning blush of light that glitters untainted on the gardens." End quote. This exquisite piece of nonsense flattered the vanity of the lady, so that he was admitted to repeat his visits at his own convenience. At this time a young fellow, who had served his apprenticeship with the late Mr. Maycock, and who was possessed of a decent fortune to begin the world, paid his addresses to the young widow, but she preferred the licentious life with Stanley to a more virtuous connection. Soon after this she quitted her house in Southwark, and the lovers spent their time at balls, plays, and assemblies till her money was dissipated, when he did not scruple to insinuate that she had been too liberal of her favours to other persons. In the meantime she bore him three children, one of whom was living at the time of the father's execution. Stanley, continuing his dissolute course of life, his parents became very uneasy in fear of the fatal consequences that might ensue, and his father, who saw too late the wrong bias he had given to his education, procured him the commission of a lieutenant to go to Cape Coast Castle in the service of the Africa Company. The young fellow seemed so pleased with this appointment that his friends conceived great hopes that he would reform. Preparations being made for his voyage, and the company having advanced a considerable sum, he went to Portsmouth in order to embark. But he had been only a few days in that town, when he was followed by Mrs. Maycock with their infant child. She reproached him with baseness, in first debauching, and then leaving her to starve and employing all the arts she was mistress of to divert him from his resolution, he gave her half the money which belonged to the company, and followed her to London with the rest. Shocked with the news of this dishonourable action, the father took to his bed and died of grief. Young Stanley appeared greatly grieved at this event, and to divert his chagrin he went to Flanders, where he stayed a considerable time when he returned to England, and lived in as abandoned a manner as before. Soon after his return, having drank freely with two tradesmen, they all walked together towards Hampstead, and meeting a Mr. Dawson with five other gentlemen, a quarrel ensued. One of the gentlemen fired a pistol, the ball from which grazed Stanley's skin. In rage thereby, the latter drew his sword, and making a pass at him, the sword ran into the body of Mr. Dawson, through the lower part of his belly, and to his backbone. The wounded man was conveyed to a neighboring house, where he lay six weeks before he was perfectly recovered. However, as Dawson happened to know Stanley, he took out a writ against him for damages, to recover the expense of the cure. 
but the writ was never executed, as Stanley was so celebrated for his skill in the use of his sword and his daring disposition that bailiffs were afraid to arrest him. Not long after this, quarrelling with Captain Chickley in a cider cellar in Covent Garden, Stanley challenged the captain to fight in a dark room. They shut themselves in, but a constable being sent for broke open the door and probably saved Stanley's life for Chickley had then ran his sword through his body, while he himself received only two slight wounds. It appears that Stanley still paid occasional visits to Mrs. Maycock, and he had the insolence to pretend anger at her receiving the visits of other persons, though he was not able to support her, for he had the vanity to think that a woman whom he had debauched ought to for ever to bear true allegiance to him as a wife to her husband. Mrs. Maycock, having been to visit a gentleman, was returning one night through Chancery Lane in company with another woman and Mr. Hammond of the Old Bailey. Stanley, in company with another man, met the parties, and he and his companion insisted on going with the women. Hammond hereupon said the ladies belonged to him. But Mrs. Maycock, now recognizing Stanley, said, "'What, Captain, is it you?' He asked her where she was going. She said to Mr. Hammonds in the Old Bailey. He replied that he was glad to meet her and would go with her. As they walked down Fleet Street, Stanley desired his companions to go back and wait for him at an appointed place. And as the company was going forward, Stanley struck a man who happened to be in his way, and kicked a woman on the same account. Being arrived at Hammond's house, the company desired Stanley to go home. But this he refused, and Mrs. Maycock, going into the kitchen, he pushed in after her, and some words having passed between them, he stabbed her so that she died in about an hour and a half. Other company going into the kitchen saw Stanley flourishing his sword while the deceased was fainting with loss of blood and crying out, I am stabbed, I am murdered. Stanley's sword being taken from him, he threw himself down by Mrs. Maycock and said, My dear Hannah, will you not speak to me? The offender being taken into custody was brought to his trial at the Old Bailey where some witnesses endeavoured to prove that he was a lunatic, but the jury, considering his extravagant conduct as the effect of his vices only, and the evidence against him being positive, he was found guilty and received sentence of death. Before his conviction he had behaved in a very inconsiderate manner, nor was his conduct much altered afterwards only that when he heard the name of Mrs. Maycock mentioned, he was seized with violent tremblings, and drops of cold sweat fell from his face. He was carried to the place of execution in a mourning coach, but on being put into the cart under the gallows, he turned pale, and was so weak that he could not stand without support. He made no speech to the people, but only said, as a hearse was provided to take away his body, he hoped no one would prevent his receiving Christian burial. It was observed that he wept bitterly after the cap was drawn over his eyes. He was executed at Tyburn on the 23rd of December, 1723, at age 25 years. Case of Stephen Gardner, who was hanged for burglary this malefactor was born in moorfields of poor parents, who put him apprentice to a weaver. But his behavior soon became so bad that his master was obliged to correct him severely, on which he ran away, and associated with blackguard boys in the streets, and then was driven home through mere hunger. His friends now determined to send him to sea, and put him on board a corn vessel, the master of which traded to France and Holland. Being an idle and useless hand on board, he was treated so roughly by his shipmates that he grew heartily tired of a seafaring life, and on his return from the first voyage he promised the utmost obedience if his friends would permit him to remain at home. This was readily complied with in the hope of his reformation, and he was now put to a waterman. 
but being impatient of restraint, he soon quitted his service, and engaged with dissolute fellows in the neighbourhood of Moorfields, with whom he played cards, dice, and etc., till he was stripped of what little money he had, and then commenced pickpocket. His first attempt of this kind was at Guild Hall, during the drawing of the lottery, when he took a wig out of a man's pocket, but though he was detected in the offence, the humanity of the surrounding multitude permitted his escape. This circumstance encouraged him to continue his practice, and about a month afterwards he was detected in picking another pocket, and notwithstanding his protestations of innocence, underwent the discipline of the horse-pond. He was now determined to give over a business which was necessarily attended with so much hazard, and afforded so little prospect of advantage. But soon afterwards he became acquainted with two notorious housebreakers, named Garraway and Sly, who offered to take him as partner. But he rejected their proposals, till one night, when he had lost all his money and most of his clothes at cards, then he went to his new acquaintance, and agreed to be concerned in their illicit practices. Garraway proposed that they should rob his own brother, which being immediately agreed to, they broke open his house, and stole most of his and his wife's wearing apparel, which they sold, and spent the money in extravagance. They in the next place robbed Garraway's uncle of a considerable quantity of plate, which they sold to a woman named Gill, who disposed of the plate, and never accounted to them for the produce. Gardner, provoked at being thus defrauded of his share of the ill-got booty, informed Jonathan Wilde of the robbery, who got him admitted an evidence against the other men, who were convicted but respited on condition of being transported. Gardner, having now been some time acquainted with a woman who kept a public house in Fleet Lane, and who was possessed of some money, he proposed to marry her, with a view of obtaining her property. And the woman listening to his offer, they were married by one of the fleet parsons. The money Gardner obtained with his spouse was soon spent in extravagance, and not long afterwards they were apprehended on suspicion of felony, and conducted to St. Sepulchre's watch-house. However, the charge against them not being validated, it was necessary to dismiss them. But before they were set at liberty, the constable said to Gardner, Beware how you come here again, or this bellman will certainly say his verses over you. For the bellman happened to be at that time in the watch-house. It has been a very ancient practice on the night preceding the execution of condemned criminals, for the bellman of the parish of St. Sepulchre to go under Newgate and ring his bell, to repeat the following verses as a piece of friendly advice to the unhappy wretches under sentence of death. All you that in the condemned hole do lie, prepare you, for to-morrow you shall die. Watch all and pray, the hour is drawing near, that you before the Almighty must appear. Examine well yourselves, in time repent, for you may not the eternal flames be sent. And when St. Sepulchre's bell to-morrow tolls, the Lord above have mercy on your souls. Past twelve o'clock. The following extract from Stowe's Survey of London, page 195, of the quarto edition, printed in 1618, will prove that the above verses ought to be repeated by a clergyman instead of a bellman. Quote, Robert Dove, citizen and merchant tailor of London, gave to the parish church of St. Sepulchre's the sum of fifty pounds, that after the several sessions of London when the prisoners remain in jail as condemned men to death, expecting execution on the morrow following, the clerk, that is, the parson, of the church, should come in the night-time, and likewise early in the morning, to the window of the prison where they lie, and there ring certain tolls with a hand-bell, 
appointed for the purpose, he doth afterwards, in a most Christian manner, put them in mind of their present condition, and ensuing execution, desiring them to be prepared, therefore, as they ought to be. When they are in the cart, and brought before the wall of the church, there he standeth ready, with the same bell, and after certain tolls, rehearseth an appointed prayer, desiring all the people there present to pray for them. The beadle also, of Merchant Taylor's Hall, hath an honest stipend allowed to see that this was duly done. End quote. Gardner was greatly affected when the constable told him that the bellman would say his verses over him. But the impression it made on his mind soon wore off, and he quickly returned to his vicious practices. In a short time after this adventure, Gardner fell into the company with one Rice Jones, and they agreed to go together on the Passing Lay, which is an artifice frequently practiced in modern times, and though the sharpers are often taken into custody, and their tricks exposed in the newspapers, yet there are repeatedly found people weak enough to submit to the imposition. The following is a description of this trick from a book formerly printed. Quote, the rogues having concerted their plan, one of them takes a countryman into a public house under pretense of any business they can think of. Then the other one comes in as a stranger, and in a little time finds a pack of cards which his companion has designedly laid on some shelf in the room, on which the two sharpers begin to play. At length one of them offers a wager on the game, and puts down his money. The other shows his cards to the countryman, to convince him that he must certainly win, and offers to let him go halves in the wager. But soon after the countryman has laid down his money, the sharpers manage the matter so as to pass off with it." End quote. This was evidently the mode of tricking formerly but it seems to have been improved on of late years, for the sharpers generally game with the countryman till he has lost all his money, and then he has only to excreate his own folly for suffering himself to be duped by a couple of rascals. In this practice our adventurers were very successful at different places, particularly at Bristol. But in this last place Jones built Gardner in such a manner as to prove that there is no truth in the observation of honour among thieves. For Jones, having defrauded a country gentleman of a gold watch and chain, a suit of laced clothes, and about a hundred guineas, gave no share of the booty to Gardiner. This induced the latter to think of revenge. But he disguised his sentiments, and they went together to Bath, where they remained some time, and then proceeded on their journey. But in the morning of which they set out, Gardner stole an iron pestle from the inn where they lay, and concealed it in his boot with the intention of murdering his companion when they should come into an unfrequented place. On their journey, Gardner General kept behind Jones, and twice took out the pestle with an intention to perpetrate the murder. But his resolution failing him, he at length dropped it in the road, unperceived by his companion. In a few days afterwards, these companions in iniquity parted, and on this occasion Jones said, Hark ye, Gardner, whither are you going? To London, said he. Why then, replied Jones, you are going to be hanged. We find that this was not the first intimation that Gardner received of the fatal consequence that must attend his illicit practices, but it appeared to have no good effect on him, for soon after he quitted Jones he broke open a house between Abergavenny and Monmouth, and finding no money, he took only a gown with which he rode off. Soon after his arrival in London he robbed a house in Addle Hill but was not apprehended for it. But in a short time he broke open the house of Mrs. Roberts, and carried off linen to the amount of twenty-five pounds. In this robbery he was assisted by John Martin, 
and both offenders being soon afterwards taken into custody, were brought to trial, capitally convicted, and received sentence of death. But Martin was afterwards reprieved on condition of transportation for fourteen years. After sentence of death, Gardner became as sincere a penitent as he had been a notorious offender. He resigned himself to his fate with the utmost submission, and before he quitted Newgate on the day of execution, he dressed himself in a shroud in which he was executed, refusing to wear any other clothes, though the weather was intensely cold. At the fatal tree he saw some of his old companions, whom he desired to take warning by his calamitous fate to avoid bad company, and embrace a life of sobriety, as the most certain road to happiness in this world and the next. He was executed at Tyburn on the 3rd of February, 1724. Particulars respecting Francis Brightwell and Benjamin Brightwell, who were tried for highway robbery and acquitted. As it is one professed design of this publication, to give trials in extraordinary cases on which the parties accused have been acquitted. In compliance with this rule, we insert the following, though it will be seen that the supposed offenders, so far from being thieves, were an ornament to human nature. In the month of August, 1724, Francis Brightwell and Benjamin Brightwell were indicted for assaulting John Partiger on the highway, and robbing him of three shillings. It was sworn by Mr. Partiker that he had been robbed on the road to Hampstead by two fellows. In the course of the following pages it will appear that this robbery was committed by Shepherd and Blueskin, dressed in soldier's clothes, and that being on the same road a few days afterwards he was showing some farmers the spot where he had been robbed at the very time the Brightwells came in sight, on which he declared that they were the persons who had robbed him, whereupon they were immediately taken into custody, which was a work of no great difficulty, as the surprise on being charged with a crime of which they were wholly innocent deprived them of all idea of resistance. These brothers were soldiers in the Grenadier Guards, and when they were carried before a magistrate, though Mr. Partiger swore positively to their persons, Francis alleged that he was on guard at the time of the robbery, and Benjamin said that he was at home. On the trial the sergeant produced the regimental book, from which it was evident that when the robbery was committed Francis was on guard at Kensington, and several persons of reputation proved that Benjamin was at his lodgings in Clare Market, and likewise gave him an excellent character. With regard to Francis, Mr. Hughes, a clergyman, delivered his testimony in the following words, quote, I have known Francis Brightwell near twenty years. He has always reputed to be a person of the fairest character for sobriety, piety, and justice. He was, to an extraordinary degree, accomplished with Latin and Greek literature, and had good skill in Roman antiquities, and in a word he carried so great a share of exquisite learning under his grenadier's cap, that I believe there is not such another grenadier in the whole universe." End quote. This testimony of Mr. Hughes was confirmed by a number of military officers, and the court and jury, considering that Mr. Partiger must have been mistaken in the parties who robbed him, the brothers were honorably acquitted. On the 22nd of the month in which he was tried, Francis Brightwell died at his lodgings at Paddington, as supposed of jail distemper. He was attended, during his short illness, by the late eminent Sir Hans Sloane, but the malignity of his disorder defied the power of medicine. The following curious letter respecting Francis Brightwell, is extracted from the newspaper called the British Journal of the 5th of September, 1724. Sir, finding that all our public papers 
from the fourth of august of this day have omitted to make honourable mention of some very remarkable circumstances relating to a very private person i desire his memory may be deposited in your journal the person i mean is francis brightwell the grenadier who is tried and acquitted at the old bailey for a robbery sworn against him and who since his coming out of prison died as tis said of the jail distemper when evidence was given against him in court brightwell by several witnesses proved that he was upon the king's guard at kensington and at the time of that robbery if a robbery was committed hereupon the court went into an inquiry concerning the reputation and character of the prisoner some officers who had known him long in the service gave testimony of his sobriety and diligence in the duty of a soldier as to his honesty a lady present in court declared that she had entrusted him with a thousand pounds at a time and a gentleman that had committed his house and goods to the value of six thousand pounds to his keeping in both trusts brightwell had acquitted himself to the satisfaction of the parties concerned these ample testimonies concurring to the honour of a man in so low a condition of life gave as you may imagine no small surprise to all that were present when a clergyman added to the astonishment by declaring that he had long known the prisoner to be not only a person of sobriety but likewise of very excellent learning and particularly in latin and greek for that brightwell had often consulted him upon difficult passages in virgil and horace thus much for what appeared at the trial of this grenadier i shall only remark upon his learning that i am amazed that scholarship is not very common among military men considering their profession admits of more leisure to hours than any other perhaps these gentlemen are afraid of knowledge from a celebrated maxim delivered by john dryden the learned are all cowards by profession and yet alexander and caesar were scholars and they did not seem to want courage but to pursue what further particulars i have learned of this deceased grenadier he was contented in his station studious of leisure and ambitious only of knowledge he had offers of being promoted to the rank of corporal or sergeant which he declined they might have as few avocations as possible from his studies neither did he ever covet money and i am apt to believe had he been at the sacking of a town he would not have thought of carrying off any other plunder but a valuable book or two take the following instance of his disregard of gain he had an excellent manner of cleaning and refurbishing arms for which he had a settled price an officer whose arms he had brightened was so pleased with his work that he sent brightwell over and above the usual price a guinea for a present the philosopher took his price and returned the guinea by the servant some time after when the gentleman saw him said he why would you not accept the guinea i sent you i am paid for my work replied the sentinel and desire no more except of a crown then if your modesty makes you think a guinea too much said the officer excuse me sir answered the veteran and do not think it vanity or affectation when i refuse your kindness but indeed sir i don't want it but i am thirsty and have no money about me so that if your honour will be pleased to give me threepence to drink your health i shall thankfully accept it this last particular of our grenadier runs so very parallel with the story in sir william temple's observations of the united provinces that i think it proper to transcribe it on this occasion volume one page fifty quote, among the many and various hospitals that are in every man's curiosity and talk that travels holland i was affected with none more than that of the aged seaman at enschusiden 
which is contrived, finished, and ordered, as if it were done with a kind of intention of some well-natured man, that those who had passed their whole lives in the hardships and incommodities of the sea should find a retreat stored with all the ease and conveniency that age is capable of feeling and enjoying and here i met with the only rich man that i ever saw in my life for one of those old seamen entertaining me with the plain stories of his fifty years voyages and adventures while i was viewing this hospital and church adjoining gave him at parting a piece of their coin about the value of a crown he took it smiling and offered me again but when i refused it he asked me what he should do with the money i left him to overcome his modesty as he could but a servant coming after me saw him give it to a little girl that opened the church door as she passed by him which made me reflect on the fantastic calculation of riches and poverty that is current to the world by which a man that wants a million is a prince and he that wants but a groat is a beggar and that this was a poor man that wanted nothing at all End quote. The case of these brothers affords an admirable lesson to prosecutors to be cautious how they swear to the identity of persons. It is better that the guilty should escape than that the innocent should be punished. It likewise affords us an instance of the mysterious providence of God. Two innocent men are charged with a crime, and the consequence of imprisonment and possibly of grief ends in the death of one of them. We may presume that he was too good for this wicked world, and that the Almighty chose this method of calling him to a better. This is the end of Part 10, Volume 1 of the New and Complete Newgate Calendar.